Chapter 1 Ferguson A City Holds Its Breath The first time I saw the name Michael Brown was on Instagram. I typically checked Instagram once or twice a week to see old college friends partying or journalism colleagues posting from airports en route to an assignment. As I scrolled through my feed on the afternoon of August 9th, my finger stopped when I reached a series of videos uploaded by Brittany Noble, a local news reporter in St. Louis whom I consider an older sister. The clip showed a disheveled woman screaming, crying. The police, she said, had killed her firstborn son. Over her shoulder, a crowd had gathered. I first met Brit Tanny, as she always teasingly insisted we pronounce it, at one of the annual gatherings of the National Association of Black Journalists. We were then both job-hungry college students and quickly hit it off while discussing the feedback we'd received on our resumes from recruiters and comparing invites to the conference's nightly receptions. Five years later, we remained part of a core group of friends from those conferences who stayed in semi-frequent touch as we tried to navigate entry-level journalism jobs. Brittany had graduated a few years earlier than me, and after bouncing around several smaller market television stations, she'd settled into a gig with KMOV, the CBS affiliate in St. Louis, which was both her hometown and that of her fiancé, Mike. As they prepared for the wedding, they decided to live in a racially diverse town not far from the city, Ferguson. Two years after taking the gig in Missouri, Brittany was working weekends, giving her Friday nights to the job, and then, after a few hours of sleep, heading back out into the field for early Saturday and Sunday morning live shots. It's the type of thankless work done by many young reporters, but she was glad to be back home. The only thing bigger than Brittany's smile is her drive, and that ambition meant she was often looking for a way to stand out on the job constantly searching for a small scoop or a neighborhood feature that her competition might have overlooked. It didn't hurt that she had connections. Her mother, before she retired, had been one of the highest-ranking black women in the history of the St. Louis Police Department. Her soon-to-be father-in-law ran a prominent black church in the city. On many days, Brittany's email and voicemail were full of story tips and ideas. Not all of the leads panned out, but it wasn't rare for her to come up with a unique angle or tidbit. Much like my own experience at the Globe, working general assignments can be a mixed bag. One day you're covering a high school graduation, the next you're camped out beside crime scene tape. And then, of course, there are the officer-involved shootings. Brittany's first came on July 1st, 2012, at her first job at a station in Saginaw, Michigan. A homeless black man, Milton Hall, had been shot and killed by the police in the parking lot of a shopping plaza. The officers responded to a 911 call about a man who had stolen a cup of coffee from a convenience store. When they arrived, they encountered Hall, who was carrying a knife, and they began to argue with him. The 49-year-old had a history of mental illness and had been living on the street. Eight officers reported to the scene, and they told investigators that when they arrived, Hall threatened a female officer with the knife and closed within a few feet of her. After a standoff of several minutes, the officers, who had formed a semicircle around Hall as he staggered forward, opened fire. With traffic driving past and several bystanders in the parking lot, the officers shot 47 bullets in total, with 11 of them riddling Hall's body. The shooting was caught on cell phone video and soon was playing on a loop on CNN. The community was outraged. They said they were going to protest and demonstrate and blow the whole place up if these officers didn't get indicted, Brittany recalled to me years later. And then the officers didn't get indicted, and nothing happened. Before Ferguson, this storyline was as common as it was hidden. A community flies into rage after a questionable police shooting. Leaders hold vigils and marches, figureheads call for accountability, and then, almost as quickly as the tragedy began, it ends. Everyone but the grieving family moves on with their lives until the next time a radio dispatcher puts out the call. Need backup. Shots fired. Officer involved.